Matthew chapter 4. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and shewed him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee head Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Turn over to Luke, if you would, Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, and in verse 14, Luke chapter 4 and verse 14. Verse 13 says, And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear him witness, and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarapta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elias the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. And all they in the synagogue, when they had heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and led him unto the brow of the hill whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way. You can go back to Matthew chapter 5 now. Go back to 4. In verse 23 it says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers disease and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had palsy, and he healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan. Okay, we 
find Jesus here right after his temptation, right after the biggest trial of his ministry, actually kicking off his ministry, where he went out in the Spirit, led of the Spirit to be tempted specifically of the devil. And at this time, as we all know the story, uh, Jesus began to simply respond with Scripture at every temptation that came his way. He said, as it is written, as it is written, as it is written. And the Bible records that the devil leaveth him for a season when this happened. Okay, So there's a good, a good guide for us about how we need to deal with temptations that enter into our lives. The same way Jesus did. That means you've got to be in your Bibles. That means you've got to be focused on the Scriptures and ready to be able to bring Scriptures up for every trial, every temptation that comes your way. Our flesh tempts us just as much as the devil tempts us. But either way, I believe Scriptures, the power is in the Scriptures for us to overcome every trial, tribulation, struggle, and temptation that enters into our life. So Christ was no different and went forth before us as an example to show us this thing. Now we find immediately after, and the reason why I turned over to Luke there, was there was that account where, where Jesus actually went from the temptation and immediately after that season had ended, he returned in that same power of the Spirit. And what did he do? He went as his manner was back to his people, back to preach the word unto them. And this word was not readily received. And this is the interesting thing about trials and temptations. We'll go through them. We'll think we just had the worst time out being tried, out being tempted, out being, being just, just beaten down by the devil and having to be on the guard and having to be prepared for, for the next attack and the next attack and the next attack. When we're weak in the flesh as Jesus was fasting, the devil enters in, attacks us, and, and we come back from this battle after he leaves us for a season, and we think we can just return to things as they were. Go to our own people, go to our own place, and sit down and do things as they were. Jesus did this. He returned in the power of the Spirit. He came and he began to minister unto the people, and he read from the book of Isaiah that, that wonderful passage which the people referred to as the gracious words that he displayed to them and gave to them. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why? Well, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. And he goes and sits down, and people are just like, wow. And they watch him, and they, he sits down, and they're, they're wondering. Is he going to say something next? I wonder what it was like. And he just had a stone face, or, or, or what even his face was like. And then he begins to say, today these scriptures are fulfilled in your ears. The Bible records that, that this was something that appeared gracious unto them in, in the beginning. Okay, well this is, this is a good message, right? He's going to preach. He's going to heal. He's going to give deliverance, set at liberty those that are bruised. And the acceptable year of the Lord, all good things, right? This day the scripture is fulfilled in your ears, but the interesting thing was that Jesus then took those same scriptures and applied them directly to himself. And he said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. And then gives the examples, and it brings great wrath upon the people. So Christ returns in the Spirit. He goes back in the Spirit. He preaches this message. He tells his people that there's going to be great deliverance. He says, the great deliverance is through me. And they were filled with such wrath that the Bible says they brought him out of the city and would have killed him. Now, how's that for a little bit of frustration when you're about to start off your ministry? All right, I'm going to start a ministry. I'm going to start a work. I'm going to start something fresh. I just got through this temptation, this trial period, and now I'm at the point where I'm ready to kick this thing off and then everybody turns on you so much that they want to kill you. They hate you. They revile you. They're saying nasty words about you. They're, they're thrusting you, not even thrusting you out here. They were going to destroy him. But Jesus, we see, he just walks through the midst of them as if nothing. <laughs> he, 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 tur he turns to himself. You can see his back to perhaps the cliff that they were going to thrust him headlong down. 
and he just turns and then just walks straight and goes through the midst of them. I don't know what what prompted them to stop. I don't know if he, he for a moment became transparent and they couldn't see him. I, I don't know exactly the miracle that took place here, whatever it was, their great wrath was just abated and, and they were they were confounded. They couldn't do what they had intended to do. And so here we find Jesus going through hard times, going through rejection. And this is the time when we, we start to think we should quit. <laughs> this is the time we start to think, hey, I, 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 what am I gonna, how am I going to put up with this? If I'm going to be this great preacher to the nations, if I'm going to be this great preacher to, to my, my city, to my country, to my continent, if, if this is what I'm going to be, Jesus being a preacher to the world, and each one of us are called to do the same, if this is what I'm going to do, and I can't even get it done in my own country, among my own people, that's it, I'm done, I'm out of here. But as some of us have discussed, I mean, the whole reason why we set up the, uh, the secret soul winner was because this is the truth of the scriptures, is that those of our own country are nearly impossible to reach by our own selves. And why is that? Well, because they know us. Because, because like, like the scripture said, is not, just, is not this he, the carpenter's son? Is not this he, Joseph's son? His mother and father are with us. That's just Jesus, right? And so they didn't want to listen to him. They didn't want to hear him. The same thing happens to us when we go to minister to the people of our own country, of our own kinsmen, of our own fellow, like our own immediate circles. It's not the time to quit, though. It's the time to actually grow in more faith because this is a verification of the scriptures. When you can't reach your mom, you can't reach your dad, your sister, your, your uncle, your cousins, when you can't reach these people that you work with, that's just verifying scriptures. People that have known you for years and years and years are likely not going to receive the gospel from you. There are miracles that happen, and I hear about them all the time. People have testified to me of miracles of immediate family. That's wonderful. That's, that's a gracious, wonderful working of God. But it's not the norm. The norm is, in fact, the rejection. The, the norm is, in fact, the, 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 them getting ready to thrust you headlong off a cliff, right? Get out of here. So Jesus returns from this and begins to do exactly what he had promised he was going to do. He said, this day the scripture is fulfilled in your eyes, in your sight. This day in your ears, this scripture is fulfilled. And so, as we saw at the end of Matthew chapter 4, he begins to just heal people like crazy. To give, reco give the recovery of sight to the blind, to, uh, to give hearing to the deaf. His fame in so much of all these miracles and all manner of sicknesses and all manner of diseases, his fame just skyrocketed. Free health care, right? And, and fast health care. I mean, they get it done, right? I just, I just enjoyed free health care last night. It, it takes a long time. Even we had a toddler and we got rushed to the, to the front of the line. But it does. It takes a long time, free health care that we have here in Canada, right? But Jesus here is, the, is this great healer in the desert that is, that is just bam, 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 just healing people one after another. They're, they're pressing if they could even touch the hem of his garment and be healed. Just beholding him is healing others. And Jesus is just being swarmed and swamped by the fame that comes about. They brought unto him sick people, all sorts that were taken with different diseases and different torments and, and various were filled with and possessed with devils. There were lunatics. There were those that had, had palsies. There were those that were maimed, that were just brought in, in, in hordes to him so that he would heal them. Verse 25 said, There followed a great multitude of people from Galilee, from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond Jordan. Just his fame was spread abroad, and this was before the internet. This, this would have been word of mouth that these things would have had have traveled. And now you can start to see even in the very foundation of Jesus' ministry why when he would heal somebody, he would often say, go tell nobody. He keep this thing quiet because it had gotten to the point, even in the first moments of his ministry, where he couldn't go anywhere without just being swarmed by people that needed something from him, needed some sort of physical relief from him, some sort of physical healing, some sort of physical release from him. And so it was that we get into chapter 5 after he's done the healings, after he's, 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 uh, he's, he's uh, preached the word as he promised, 
and he begins to need a little bit of a break. He, be he begins to, to need a little bit of space, and that's what you find when the Sermon on the Mount begins. Now, the way I believe the Sermon on the Mount took place is, is pretty much defined in chapter 1, or chapter 5 and verse 1. It says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. So the previous verse, verse 25, says, There followed great multitudes of people. It says, the verse before that, his fame went abroad, and so that all types were coming unto him. They were swarming from all places. Now Jesus here in verse 1 sees the multitude, and he goes up into a mountain. He went up into a mountain. He got away from them, best he could. So what I think happened likely in this scenario is he went unto the mountain, he sat down, and his disciples came unto him. So the ones that knew where he was, and the ones that knew where he would be, came unto him at this time. So this is a teaching that is primarily for the believers, primarily for the disciples. Now, what likely happened is that because his fame went abroad into all these places, eventually the multitude caught up to him. Because I think as, as you look over, you're going to find, after chapter 7, Judge Not. He would come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. So 8 and verse 1, it says, When he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. So he went, he saw the multitudes, he's like, I'm out of here. He gets up there with his disciples, but when he comes down, three chapters later after preaching this message, great multitudes are following him again. They found him, right? So they, they swarmed him again. And so they would have caught some of the end of this teaching, but... The ones that I'm really going to focus on, and I think actually if you read it, you're going to start to see that, that as, it, as it goes on, his, his teaching gets a little bit more broad and a little bit more basic, kind of catchy for everybody. It's almost like he, he saw you know, just a few of his disciples who had already learned a few things and had grown in the scriptures and, and knew a little bit. And then as, as it grew, it became full of unlearned young people, uh, un, un, uneducated perhaps, just, just all multitudes and types. So he started to change his message a little bit as it went on, and it kind of trickled out, became more broad. But anyways, the first portion of it, I believe, is what I'm going to focus on. It's, it's really just, just showing that, hey, hard times rejection, and that's what he just came from, right? Hard times rejection, people needing something from you but giving nothing back, um, struggles, the, the trials that you just went through, being rejected by your family and, and those closest to you. The, the first thing that he wants them to focus on is just, just hey, be blessed. Don't forget. you you got to remember now to be blessed. Okay? Remember you are blessed. And so it goes in verse 2. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven belongs unto those that are poor in spirit. If you're poor in spirit, you're not, you're not puffed up in spirit. You're not thinking you're wealthy in spirit. And I, I find myself in this scenario all the time where I just, I just feel inferior as a Christian. I feel like I'm not, I'm not where I ought to be. I feel like I am, I am weak. And I'm not just saying that in some sort of vain show of humility. I'm just, I'm just saying, hey, hey, oh wretched man that I am. You know, I, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? You know, I, I thank God that one day I will be redeemed. But for now, hey, it, it's blessed to be poor in spirit. Why? Because God can grow that poor spirit. God can take that lowly spirit, that, that spirit that has need, and he can grow it and give it to the kingdom of heaven. Verse 4, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And how often do we mourn and think that, hey, this will never end? How often do we mourn and we're, we're sad and we're sorrowful and we think that there's no end to this? Well, here's a promise from God you can go to. If you're mourning, you're blessed. You will be comforted. And you'll be comforted greatly. You'll be comforted by the comforter of all people himself. Verse 5 said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What's that saying? If you're low, if you're if you humble yourself, if you're abased, you shall be exalted. Too often we in our pride try to inherit the earth, try to take the earth, right? The the, the meek inherit it, the pride proud try to take it and they're abased. They inherit nothing at all. 
But God here is promising, hey, if you're meek, you shall inherit the earth. In other words, and, and meekness isn't weakness, don't get me wrong. Uh, uh, people often think that meekness is just like timid and, and weak and just soft. No, no, meekness is great strength, but appropriating it. You know, giving it its place. The Bible said of Moses that he was the meekest of all men, and yet he killed an Egyptian with his bare hands. That doesn't sound like a weak person, does it, right? He was meek, in other words... He, he in his past did stuff like that, blew off and killed an Egyptian with his hands, but he learned to restrain that and be, be meek and try to control his anger. Obviously, he still messed it up a little bit when he broke the Ten Commandments, but you know that it is what it is. Or when he smited the rock when he was supposed to speak to it. All these things. But Moses is just another example of one that is, is meek, the Bible says, and shall inherit the earth, though he has his problems himself. Verse 6 is, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. We often hunger and thirst after the things that fill our belly. Well, the Bible records that we should hunger and thirst after righteousness, growing in righteousness, longing after righteousness. And how are we going to get righteousness but by having more of the God that provides it? The Bible records that you shall be filled if you're hungering, striving after, thirsting after righteousness not the righteousness that comes by keeping the law but the righteousness that comes by simply being a vessel a chosen vessel that Christ can use for his own glory verse 7 blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy how's that for the law of sowing and reaping if you if you if you plant mercy you'll get mercy right this is how the world works sow and reap and sow and reap and sow and reap it doesn't come instantaneously but we need to understand that when we're often when we are judgmental, and when we are when we are when we are attacking people, and when we are we are overly um, punishing people, you know, if, if, if we're, we're really harsh with people, you know, he deserves such and such. We will get that same back into us when God goes to judge our sins and our faults and our failures. And this is where you can go back to number three and just say verse 3 and say, hey, you need to be poor in spirit. Don't be high in spirit. Don't be puffed up in spirit. Think you're holier than thou. You need to be sowing mercy because you want mercy. The reality is, is that all of us need more mercy in our lives because each one of us slips. Each one of us has wrong thoughts. Each one of us sins before a trice holy God. Verse 8 says, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God clarity cleanness right the, the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in the furnace of earth purified seven times that's what purity is it's it's without anything other than that it's just it's just clean so if you want to see God you need to have a pure heart a pure heart is one that doesn't have dirt in it rot in it rust in it corrosion in it corruption in it Okay, what's your heart? Your mind, your will, and your emotions? Are you filling that constantly with the things of this world, the things of television, entertainments, with, 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 uh, with, with strange and unusual and filthy thoughts? Whatever it is that, that enters into your mind, into your heart, into your being, that keeps you from seeing God. Because your mind needs to be focused. It needs to be completely set upon the Lord. And when it is, that's the purity that you get. The Bible records of, of the washing of the water of the word. That's what the husband is, is to provide for his wife. And I think the principle goes for everybody. If you open this word, you read this word, it will wash you. It will cleanse you. It will purify you. And when it does, you shall see God. That's what the Bible is promising. You need to have a pure heart. Pure in heart, you shall see God. Wonderful promise there. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Verse 9. And nobody but the children of God can really be a peacemaker. Well, what's a peacemaker? This isn't the soldiers that Canada sends over to the other side of the world. No. A peacemaker is one that brings peace between two parties, okay? We are ambassadors for Christ trying to reconcile men to their father. Right? We're trying to bring peace between all the people of this city, between all the people of this province, between all the people of this country and beyond. We are trying to be peacemakers to go, lost sinner, meet your father. Father, he is sorry that he has done this. He wants you to save him. 
Be reunited. Be reconciled. Have peace one with another. And we do that as the children of God. That's our duty. That's our responsibility. We're the only ones given that commission. The Bible says when we are born again, we are born again and given power to become the sons of God. We become the children of God. Therefore, we now have that ministry of reconciliation where we can bring peace between a father that is angry with the sinner every day and men that really want nothing to do with God. <laughs> you can see how that's a very difficult situation. That's why, that's why soul winning, though sometimes we go and it's just so easy, that's why you, you, can, you can understand why sometimes it's just really hard to get people saved. Because, because man's over here saying, ah, oh, I want nothing to do with this God. And God's over here saying, I'm angry with the wicked every day and I can't hear his prayers. And so it takes us to go and stand in the gap and take his hand, take the Lord's hand through the word and put them together and get them on the same page. Peacemakers, blessed are they, they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Another promise of kingdom possession for those that are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Now this isn't being persecuted because you did something dumb and you deserve to be persecuted. right? This is being persecuted for when you do something right. Blessed are you when you do right and men revile you. Right? If you suffer because you've wronged, well, <laughs> it is what it is, right? But here God says, hey, if you're persecuted because you've done right, blessed are you. Another place it says, happy are ye. You need to, you need to rejoice in these things, right? Because, because great joy is going to be fulfilled in that. It says that. It continues. Verse 11, blessed are ye when men shall revile you. And persecute you, and she'll say, All manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. And that falsely there is key again. People say all manner of evil against you. Well, if it's true, then then well, you're not very blessed. You, you, you messed up. Someone says evil against you. Well, you just you just take it on the chin, do better next time. But when people revile you and persecute you and and, and, and say wicked things about you falsely, well, blessed are you. You don't feel blessed quite often in some of these situations, do you? But verse 12 continues and said, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they, the prophets which are before you, which were before you. You're in good company when you're persecuted for righteousness' sake. Because you can read just story after story after story in the Bible of great men of God who were persecuted for simply doing what was right before the Lord. Right? There's also men like Jonah who, who did wrong and was, was, was swallowed up by a whale after being, nearly, after being shipwrecked and thrown off. You know, nearly shipwrecked, thrown off the boat, all that kind of stuff happened to him because he had done wrong. But... The majority of what you see is a blessing that comes in a rejoicing. I mean, people must have thought the apostles were crazy when they were beaten. And they, they, they ran away, you know, fists in the air, excited, rejoicing, all the way back to tell all the other disciples what had happened and how they had suffered for his name. Why would you rejoice in those things? Because, again, we need to be kingdom focused. We need to have our minds on, on the pride, our eyes on what's, what's to come. Right? If we're focusing on what's going on now, then it's, it's no fun when, when, when your spouse is fighting with you. It's no, it's no fun when your neighbor uh, yells things at you. It, it's, it's no fun when your co-workers are whispering and chatting about you. It's no, it's no, it's, it's no, it's not, it doesn't seem blessed, does it? It doesn't seem like a, a good and blessed thing. Like, oh, this is wonderful. No, but if you're focused on the kingdom, then you can actually foresee through the eyes of faith the fact that you have an exceeding great reward for those sufferings that you're going through. You have an exceeding great reward for the reviling that comes upon you, for the persecution that comes upon you, for the, for the evil that's spoken about you falsely. There is a great and wonderful reward waiting. Rejoice in that. Because again, all these things don't seem blessed necessarily just that face value who's gonna who in this world that we live in says being poor in anything is a blessed position who in this world says mourning is a blessed 
thing. Who says being meek, in other words, not using the strength that you have to get what you want, is, is, is a blessed thing? Hungering, thirsting, uh, you know, having, having pureness. <laughs> Who in the world thinks that that's a good thing, a blessed position in a world that's as corrupt as it is? Being persecuted. None of these ideas come with a blessing from the worldly, carnal mind in that standpoint. But if you're thinking about the big picture, then you can finally put things into the proper perspective as God's trying to highlight here. And I think he did that on purpose. This is the first sermon. After the sermon he preached, you know, that, that very quick little message that, hey, I'm going to, to give sight to the blind. I'm going to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. I'm going to give deliverance to the captives. And that's me. <laughs> that, that is me that is going to do this. And they took him and they th were about to throw him off a cliff headlong. He returns from that through a miracle. He begins healing people. And then the first message back is this. Hey, blessed are you when, when that happens. Blessed are you when you go through that. Blessed are you when you struggle with this. And you can just enter in whatever is going on in your life right now. Blessed are you when for the right reasons, right? If you are hurting, if you are harmed, if you are struggling for the right reasons, Blessed are you. Look to that reward that's coming. Be exceeding glad for it. The Bible says in verse 13, here's what we are. Ye are the salt of the earth. That means you, you're the preservative of the earth. You're the savor of the earth. You're, you're, what, you're what gives it a taste. You're, you're, you're what's here to, to keep it sustained, right? You, you put salt on meat to make it last longer. You put salt on an egg to make it taste good. Ye are the salt of the of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out, to be trodden underfoot of men. You need to be salt, it's wonderful, but if there's no savor to it, then then it's worthless. It's just, it's just a it's just a crunchy rock, right? Just might as well be the sand on the ground. You're also the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Here's the rub. Here, here's, here's what Jesus is bringing to light here. He's saying, hey, look what I just went through. Okay, you're next. Rejoice in these things, in these trials, and these struggles. When Satan comes at you, give him my word. I'll do the work. When the world comes at you and wants to throw you down headlong, hey, wait for my miracle. I'll take care of you. When you're, when you're needing some space, come and be with me and let me teach you some things. And just remember, through it all, blessed are ye when you go through these troubles and these trials. And this, this world in general is not a very hospitable and loving place for Christians, is it? You're blessed here, people. You're, you're, you're blessed and you got to rejoice because as you go through this life, you are earning perhaps rewards in heaven for the things which you suffer and the things which you gain and things which you go through. You as Christians are salt. You as Christians are light. You need to be salt that has savor. You need to have, have salt that does what it's supposed to do. What is it supposed to do? Well, it's supposed to be poor in spirit. It's supposed to be one that mourns and it's covered. It's supposed to be a peacemaker, bringing the gospel to people. It, you're supposed to be the salt that preserves and sustains life where we're living at this moment. You're salt and you need to have savor. And you are a light that shouldn't be hid. Don't put it under a bushel. Don't try to hide it away in the closet. Some people think that they're, they're, they're wonderful Christians because they do it behind closed doors. We need to take our light as a city on a hill that cannot be hid. You don't take a candlestick and tuck it underneath, the, underneath something or behind something, right? That candle needs to have space to flicker and to flame, and it needs to be out in a prominent place so that it'll do what it's intended for. 
You know a little candle can heat up an entire vehicle in the dead of winter? That's what they say. They say something you should bring. Everybody should have a candle in their car. So if you get stuck, right, you can just take that little candle and light it up. And that could be enough, even in a Canadian winter, to sustain you. That little light, right? But only if it's set in a prominent place, where it's supposed to be, where it's seen, where it gives light. The same is true of the light of the candle in the house. Keep candles about your house and matches near them. Why? Because when the lights go out, you can put the candle in the prominent place and light it. And it'll give light to even, even the darkest of rooms. It's amazing. Try it sometime. Prepare for those types of things beforehand so you have them ready. Even, 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 even do it in advance so you can see what God's trying to say here. You're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let your salt show. So salt this earth. Why? So the same thing could be done so they could see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. What's Christ saying here? He's saying, hey, the world's going to hate it, but let them see it. <laughs> the world's not going to like you, but let them see it. Let them witness it. Let them, let them bear record that, that you are that light. You are the salt. There is something different about you. You may not gather multitudes like Jesus did, but you will perform what he has particularly planned for you, and you'll be blessed in it. Rejoice in these things. Rejoice in these things. And this is what I, I, I love about this little passage of Scripture, is just how Christ is walking through his first moments of his ministry, and as, as soon as he gets alone with his disciples, he wants to tell them, hey, you guys are going to go through some things. You've seen what I've gone through. It's, it, it's coming for you, okay? But recognize that you're blessed, and keep doing what I want you to do. Keep getting after what I need you to do. Keep being salt that has the savor of of salt. Keep being light that lights appropriately what it's supposed to light and gives light unto all men. Keep being a Christian that looks like a Christian, acts like a Christian, talks like a Christian, and you'll be blessed in it. Let your light, let your good works be seen by men that they may glorify your Father which is in heaven, and if they don't glorify Him, do it anyways. If they don't rejoice in the good works that you are doing, if they revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you, do it anyways. Keep being that light. Keep being that salt. And keep getting exceeding great rewards in heaven for doing the same. That's what he's promising here. Thank you.